guys, so good afternoon everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I hope this will be very productive for you and for us as well. Right, so I would like to introduce Gary. Um, I would just let you... Yeah, no problem. I can give my, uh, my background. So, guys, thanks for coming tonight. First, the first thing I wanted to say was how great the turnout is for this session, considering it's a really cold January evening and you guys are probably in the middle of a, quite an intense period of exams and study. I think it's really great that so many people have made the effort to come out and kind of learn a little bit more for their sport. And hopefully what I want to be able to give you guys um, for your time is many, many different ways that you can directly make yourself better at volleyball without working too hard in a really short space of time. That's my objective, yeah? Um, so tonight's talk is around kind of strength and conditioning and physical preparation for volleyball. Um, my background is as a strength and conditioning coach for all sports. So I used to work in, in university strength and conditioning. So the guys that work down in your HPC, um, that used to be me over in Sheffield Hallam, over at Derby University and at Coventry University. So I've worked with athletes for maybe the past 10 years in university level, but also as part of my roles, I, got, I became involved with volleyball um, around the London 2012 Olympics. So I was responsible for and involved with preparing the women's team uh, for, for Great Britain for that Olympic Games. Um, and then since then, I've been involved with Volleyball England as their kind of head of strength and conditioning and support their programmes right from senior level all the way through to the, the national level pathway athletes. Um, so I've got had a lot of exposure over the last five years working with volleyball. And then I've set up my own business or website. It's effectively a blog that shares information um, called Volley Science. And that is something that I've been working on for the last two years, just trying to give information to people like yourself so that they can enjoy the sport that they, that they love even more. Um, so that's me. Um, like I say, I've had experience working with athletes in every single different sport. And what I'm trying to do in tonight's session is distill that information into three hours. In that three hours, we're going to do a lot of stuff. We're going to have... A about 20 minutes, half an hour of just talking through some basic theory. Then we're going to do some practical things around learning about your body. So you might have a good understanding of how your body operates, but we'll spend a little bit more time on that today, particularly in a volleyball context. Yeah. Then what we'll do is we'll come back and look at training. So we'll have a look at what's specific for volleyball, then have a look at what's specific for training volleyball. And then we'll try and put that into practice in the High Performance Centre. Has anyone got any questions to start with on that? Everyone happy? Show me that you're happy. Yeah, cool. Um, so, what I wanted to start with was a question to you guys. Um, which position in volleyball is the most likely to, to receive an injury or to get injured? So take a minute and just talk to the person next to you. Try and work out which position or playing position is most likely to receive or become injured. Everybody's got a chance. <laughs> So, what answers are we coming back with? What, what do you think? So, middle or setter? We've got setter. <laughs> Any other ideas? Or does everyone think middle or setter are the kind of... Outside hitter, maybe? Why? Because of the way they move. Okay, so outside hitters have to move quite a bit. Yeah. Um, maybe over kind of larger ranges than other players on court. Um, thinking about the setters, they're probably comparable. They're moving a lot. Um, maybe not jumping as much uh, as an outside hitter. Actually, based on a study that the FIVB ran over the course of four years, looking at every international competition and all of the injuries that took place in those competitions at 
World League level, Grand Prix level, right through to under 18s and under 20s, the most commonly injured pl player is a middle. So if you bet in middle, then, the, then you guys win. Um, but it's like some of you guys identified, kind of everybody's at a risk of injury. It's a, it's a dynamic, high-paced sport, and you have to be on top of your, your physical self to be able to keep yourself safe and injury-free. Yeah? One of the biggest things that, that I'm kind of focused on is making sure that athletes are prepared to just play the sport without getting injured. And sometimes you can't avoid an injury. Yeah, sometimes you'll jump and you'll land on somebody else's foot because they're underneath the net and there's nothing that you can really do about it. But what you can do is you can increase your chances of not being injured. So part of what we'll start with tonight is around how do we minimise our chances of injury? And that's one of the things that S&C or physical preparation is really focused on. It's allowing you guys to play more volleyball through not being injured. The second thing is the kind of sexy piece around learning to jump higher, learning to run faster, hit harder, and do all those physical things that people really want to kind of see spectacular movement and spectacular actions in their game. Yeah? Um, all of those things are underpinned by physical competence and physical process. So I want to introduce you to a kind of pathway that you can think about any training session, any development that you've got in the sport, um, to try and just start considering how physical is actually a part of every training session that you do. And doing s &C as a separate thing isn't something that you necessarily have to do. It's an, a way to add and supplement the volleyball that you already play. So, on that point, has anybody heard of the tactical, technical, mental and physical coaching model? No? It's something that's used a lot in coach education. I wasn't sure whether you guys would have heard of it, depending on what courses you're on. But what it says is that any sport can be broken down into tactical, technical, mental and physical components. And that kind of encapsulates the entire sport. Yeah? Um, what I want to kind of prompt you guys to think about is that in a training session. So usually it's pictured as a cycle, but really I think it's a bit of a hierarchy. So if you turn up to a training session and you are mentally just not in the right place, you've got other things going on, you're distracted, how good is your training session going to be? You know straight away it's going to be terrible. Yeah? Part of your job as an athlete is to like, walk through the door and switch on and change that mentality straight away so you can get the most from training or competition. But really, it's very difficult to do that. It's a skill. So for me, that mental piece is the most important piece of the puzzle when you first start your training session. That sets the tone for where you're at. When we're in a volleyball training session, we've got our technical and our tactical pieces, which are the absolute focus of what we're trying to do. Yeah? We're trying to get better at technical things that we use in the game to be able to manage the tactical pieces of our gameplay. Yeah? If we can't do a technical skill, it means we, we're limited in our tactics. And actually tactics are what go and win you games or win you competitions. The physical piece kind of floats in there in that <laughs> physical sits in between. There's certain physical factors that impact on your technical skill. So my, question, my next question to you guys is what, kind of, what are the technical skills that we need to be able to do really well as volleyball players to be good at the sport? Movement. So movement, we need to be able to move just from a basic standpoint, which directions? So lots of movement, uh, even up and down, yeah? So all directions. Any other skills that are really important in the game? I'll give you a clue. Yeah, so a basic overhand pass, underhand pass, they're skills and techniques that we need to do well to be able to get a good output and play the game that we want to play. 
Yeah? So, I want to consider these and build our strength and conditioning and physical preparation advice specifically around those things because that's how we're, that's how we're efficient. What I'm not a big fan of is using a shotgun to open a front door. I'd rather just use the key. So if we're going to, we could talk about how lifting weights, getting stronger, doing all of the, the kind of what I referred to earlier as sexy stuff in SNC is really important. But actually that's kind of using the, the shotgun to blow a hole through the front door so you can walk through it. In this session, what I'd like to think about is the specific things we need to do well in volleyball. What are their physical requirements? And then how can we get really good at those so that the physical side isn't limiting our volleyball play? So we've got things like dig, jump, set. We've got movement as a, a broader term. I'd like to take the dig action as an example of what, looking at a particular movement from a physical standpoint. <clears throat> and that's going to be my challenge to you guys throughout the rest of this session is how can we think about things in a, from a physical point of view or through the physical lenses? So, everybody stand up. Find yourself a little bit of space. And show me your, your best serve-receive passing position. How would you move to pass a ball? So imagine you're standing on court. So you've got somebody over the other side of the net has just rolled a ball up. They're going to jump serve it over the net to you. Show me your receive position. Cool. So everyone's hitting a similar place. Yeah. What are the key physical things that allow you to do that? So being able to squat, squat pattern, or what I'd kind of think about instead of squat is triple flexion or triple extension. So we need our hips, our knees, and our ankles all to work together to be able to function in the same way, either flexing or extending. That kind of links into one of those other movements. Anything else? Core stability. Core stability, that's an interesting one. What do you mean? <coughs> Yeah. So to, to pass effectively, what we need to do, what's the most important piece of a pass? Your arms, because your, your arms dictate where the ball's going to go. So that contact point is the most important piece. What dictates where your arms are? Shoulders. shoulders. What dictates where your shoulders are? Yes. Your trunk and torso. You might see where this is going. Into your hips and lower body and your connection with the floor. So actually that chain through your body is really important to managing the pass. If something in your body is stopping you from getting into the right position to be able to pass that ball, if it's your core stability and you're in a position here where your hips and shoulders are completely disconnected and you're firing a ball somewhere else, or if it's your balance, if it's your, um, you might be your range of motion. So the range of motion around your ankle has a big impact on how your body positions itself to try and pass a ball. What I want to do is just give you an example of that. So, in that passing position, or let's take a squat because it's a bit easier. What I'd like you to do is try and sit down into a squat as low as you can go, but your knees can't move. So they have to stay exactly where they are. They can't shift forwards. You have to keep your knees still. Try and sit down as far as you can go. So you start to notice that your body kind of changes its position. Stand yourselves up. Now allow your knees to move. Keep your weight on your heel, but try and sit down now. <laughs> so you're allowed to let those knees shift forward and sit down through as low as you can go into that squat. Which is easier? This is much easier. Um, so from a physical standpoint, if you think about just something simple like the range around your ankle, if your range around your ankle is limited, 
so your knee can't travel forwards, you can still go down into those positions, but other areas have to change to allow you to do that. So your torso has to bow forward further. Now, that's much more of a difficult position to pass from than being a little bit more upright. And that could be down to just a simple lack of range in your ankle. Does that make sense to everybody? So take a seat again. Um, what I want to look at through the session today is, okay, where are the key joints in our body that dictate all of these movements? What are the areas that we need to know a lot about to make sure that we are not limiting these? Because similarly with your jump, if you've got a lack of ankle, ankle range, it's going to have a similar impact. You're going to have to lean through your torso a lot and lose the plantar flexion or that drive from your ankle that you get when you're jumping. So it loses you inches off your jump. So developing range around your ankle could also improve your jump. So we're working across a couple of those different things, all with one simple activity, which you can do really easily at home or at a training session or in a cool down at any time you'd like. But it makes you a better athlete across all of those things. So that's where this piece around being efficient and specific is really important for me. Does everybody understand where I'm going with that? Sometimes it seems simple and sometimes it's really complex. So hopefully it seems really simple. Okay, good. So what I want to move into now is take that concept and apply it to a couple of different tests of your body to see where you're at specifically. Then I can give you training advice that's specific for you. So has everyone got their mobile phone? Cool. It's kind of a stupid question, really, because uh, I can't imagine any students leaving their mobile phone at home. Um, you've lost yours. <laughs> no, that shows me. Um, so what I'd like you to do is just pair up with someone, and then you'll be able to fill this stuff in like later on. If you've got something to make notes on, just make sure you take some notes. So what I'd like you to do is open your web browser and go to www.pbjumps.com. Yeah. The only reason that we're doing this is because I've set up a, a free assessment tool that allows you guys to get your, your physical results straight away rather than having to calculate them. <laughs> www.pbjumps.com yeah, so go on to register. It'll just, it's just an email address. So if you guys register on there, it'll take you to a page where you're answering a load of questions. Dot com. Um, if you can, yeah. All it'll mean is that it allows you to do these assessments. And you'll get some emails from me from Volley Science, but if you want to opt out, that's fine. That's up to you. Now it's victory. DJ Challenge. So Whatever it is, I'll pay the cost. I'm willing to risk it, I'll pay the loss. I put it all on the line. <laughs> so bring yourselves back in. Now, hopefully you'll all see now that you've got, well, if you've been able to fill in your results, that you've got a spider diagram and some, some ideas of um, a 0 to 100% on each of those sides for each of those tests. Um, now, that is yours. You can keep that. That's kind of a snapshot of where you're at today um, for you to keep forever. And I think that's one of the benefits of testing is that it's almost a snapshot of where you're at now based on that idea of, okay, if your mental state is rubbish, that's a snapshot of when your mental state is rubbish. If your mental state was really good, great. That's where we're at. But when you look back on it then, you can know that's how I represent myself on that particular day. And the real benefit of knowing that is... When you're playing really well, it's good to have that information to look back at when you're playing really badly, because nobody plays really well all the time. So when you're having those blips in your performance and you're not really sure why, 
having something like that is really useful to look back and say, well, this is what I looked like when I was playing quite well, so let's maybe try and do some of the things when I was playing quite well. Um, so, looking at that spider diagram, has anyone got a perfect circle? A fair bit of perfect circle. Has anybody got their line on their spider diagram all the way around the outside? If you've got the line around the outside, that means in comparison for what we need for volleyball, you're in a quite a good place. Yeah? If you've got anything that isn't quite at the outside, there are things that are slightly inside. There are areas that we can work on a little bit. So, that's just an example for volleyball in general. So, that's what I'd say your diagram would look like if they're, that's what your diagram would look like if there was nothing limiting the way that you play. That's a really kind of good position to be in, but it's also a really rubbish position to be in, because if you're trying to get better and you're already there, and you've got to look for somewhere else to improve. If your spider diagram is something like this, which it usually, usually is, that's frustrating because you're not quite at the outside and there are things limiting your play, but also really good because these areas that are somewhere inside the graph are things that you can work on and build up. Now, the tests that we've just done are also exercises to get better at the tests that we've just done. I know that's a bit of a tongue twister. but So, already now you've got five exercises that you can prioritise into a warm-up or cool-down that are specifically targeted to the areas that you need to get better at. So, if you're outside, if you've got movements that are outside the circle, let's say your ankle... You've got outside the circle, you've got what I'd say is full range for volleyball. You probably don't need to think too much about working on your ankle. So you might warm up by doing a few reps of that exercise, but then get onto something else. If you've got an area on here where, okay, my active straight leg raise, my, ham, my hip flexion is rubbish, it's right on the inside, that's something that I might want to spend a little bit more time on in my warm-ups. Yeah? So I might do six reps of my ankle exercise in warm-up before I go and play volleyball, but then 12 to 15 reps of my hamstring exercise. So you're getting more exposure, and more exposure usually helps you become better. Does that make sense? So hopefully from that... You've got a really quick and easy... How long would you think it would take to do those five exercises if you're pretty good at it? We've just spent maybe 45 minutes an hour on it. I'd call that my five in five exercises. Five exercises in five minutes at most. And you can do them, like, anywhere. And those five exercises target volleyball skills that are really important to be able to get better at the game. Hopefully now you've got a little toolbox that's specific to you to help you be better at volleyball. Yeah? It doesn't happen like that. If you did those exercises every day for the next three weeks, you'd see a big change. So if you've got a result that you feel is really rubbish, actually you can change it quite quickly. And thinking about Buck's performance, if, how many of you guys are in the Buck squads? So like everybody? Okay, so thinking about Buck's competition, if you've got games left in the season and you can make a physical change in three weeks that will help you hit harder, it's probably going to help you before the end of the season when it becomes really essential. All for five minutes in a warm-up. Now, something that I want to think about now, and this is a little bit more to do with the training side, but just building on that, how often do you guys train? Okay, so 
Let's say three, we'll take the game into account. So we're doing volleyball three times a week. If we take five minutes, it's 15 minutes a week of training. Doesn't sound like a lot. Then how many weeks would you say you train volleyball in a year? Maybe 30 uh, when you're at uni? Yeah. Does anybody train outside of uni? Yeah, a couple. So it might be more than this for some of you. But 15 minutes times 30, who's, who studies maths? <laughs> Is that right? Test me. I think that's right. So 450 minutes. So that's seven and a half hours of extra training across your university year that you've just bought yourself just from doing a five minute warm up. Now, one of the biggest things that people forget about training and your body is that consistency is the most important thing. If you do something consistently, even though it's a little thing, you can make big changes. It's like, a, it's like water dripping onto a rock. So water dripping onto a rock doesn't change it in a day-to-day -day process, in kind of a measurable way day-to-day. But across thousands of years, it changes flat, flat plains into deep canyons. Yeah, and it's the same with your body. We're not going to train for thousands of years. We adapt quicker than that. But five minutes each time you train, when you're already training and ready to go, can make a huge difference. So there's my sales pitch for you guys in terms of that information and being able to take it and apply it. Yeah. Now what I'd like to start to think about is okay on a broader context how do we manage the movements in volleyball so we've looked at our kind of i guess our acute ranges of motion now i want to look at how we manage our whole body in the way in the spaces that we move in in volleyball yeah so does anybody in here study physics maths so Does, how many dimensions of space are there? Three. Three dimensions of space, unless you've got somebody who studies physics and then there's like 15. <laughs> so, but as an SNC coach, I'm a simple person. I like things as simple as possible. So we're going to work with three dimensions of space. Yeah, It's really important to think about that because that means there's three dimensions that we can move our body in. Yeah. The first is forwards and backwards. You call up the sagittal plane. You've got side to side. You call that the frontal plane. And then you've got rotating, and you call that the transverse plane. Yeah? So we've got three options. We've got rotate, we've got cartwheel, and we've got front flip. And those three options make up every single movement that we do. Is everyone with me on that? Because that took me about five years to understand. I, they teach it in the first class you ever do in, in biomechanics, but it took me a long time. Um, so we've got our three planes of motion. What I want to do just quickly is think about a couple of the movements that we do in volleyball from a point of view of planes of motion. Yeah? So let's have a think about the, what's your favorite movement in volleyball? Everybody goes quiet, but everybody's got the fav same favourite. Everybody loves hitting. Yeah? <laughs> so, let's take the hit as an example. Uh, from the point of view of planes of motion, which planes do we operate in? And what are we doing in those planes during our spike <coughs> hit? Well, we can split, split the spike into two actions, can't we? There's the jump and then there's the, the contact with the ball, the hit, yeah, in the most simple sense. So in our jumping movement, which plane do you think most of the things are taking place in? This one, yeah, sagittal. So most things, if we were to look at it from the side, most things are gonna be happening in that frontal, in that sagittal plane, 
yeah? If we looked at it in the front, all we'd see is somebody dip down. If we looked at it from the top, all we'd see is very little. So most of the action is taking place this way. If we're hitting, which plane is the most important plane? Probably your rotation, yeah? So we're thinking about, for our hit, we're trying to create movement in the sagittal plane. And we're trying to stabilize movement in the frontal plane and the transverse plane. So, if we're training physically, we want to be able to try and mimic those things. Does everybody understand the idea that when there's movement happening, we want to train movement, and when there's not movement happening, we want to train not movement happening? Or oh, stabilizing. Okay, so in the hit, we've got lots of movement going on this direction. Is there any other movement going on in a perfect world? So we'd perhaps have some movement going on in the sagittal plane. Yeah, so what about the frontal plane? Is movement in the frontal plane when you're hitting good? Probably not. No, so we'll see a lot of the time that the idea of your left shoulder collapsing when you're contacting and pulling the ball down into the net, that's an example of movement in the frontal plane and not stabilizing and controlling that movement, yeah? So for our hitting, what we wanna be good at is creating movement and stabilizing these two, and then staying stable here but creating movement on this one. So for our training, we can gear it around that. Now we know we want to try and stabilize frontal plane movement, we can pick exercises that work on that, that idea. A really obvious frontal plane exercise where we're trying to stabilize is a side plank. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So show me a side plank, everybody. So side plank is a really good exercise for stabilizing frontal plane movement. How can we make a side plank harder? So rotation how? Putting one leg up. Yeah. pushing your hips up further. So there's so many different ways that we can make that exercise a little bit more difficult. If you think about it from a volleyball context, what we'll see is that claps through the torso. So what we want, we've got that hip popping down. We wanna be able to practice pulling it back up tall. So an exercise that I really like is similar to this, where we've got a hand over our head. You might be down in that side plank you might have a reach up, but trying to dip that hip and re-correct. So you're almost doing the opposite movement to what you, want to, what you don't want to see on court. You're strengthening that pattern. Does that make sense? So give that a go. Sit yourselves back up. That's just one example of how we can be really specific to volleyball. So, we can say that for our frontal plane, trying to stabilize movement or even doing the opposite movement and getting good at stabilizing it, that's ticking our box. Yeah, we've now got an exercise that does that specifically for hitting in volleyball. Now, I could throw the same challenge at you guys, and I'm sure you could come up with the right answers around transverse plane so rotation we want to generate rotation so how can we practice generating rotation twist. stuff where or oh, russian twist is one does everybody know what a russian twist is yeah but how can we make it really 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 relevant to volleyball 
what exercise, what kind of looks like hitting. Throwing is a really good way to try and work that chain. Yeah. If you, how heavy is a volleyball? It's really light. It's almost a quarter of a kilo. So anything that's heavier than a quarter of a kilo when you throw it is physical training for volleyball hitting. As long as you follow that pattern of hip, shoulder, arm. Does that make sense? If we wanted to go a little bit further and get stronger at it, we could do things like Russian twists where we're looking at the difference between our shoulder and our hip. Um, what other exercises can you think of? Transverse plane's tough, isn't it? So what, we'll, what you'll quite often see is things with the cable machine, yeah? Where we're pulling things across our body or how many of you have one of these? <coughs> so these are really useful. Yeah, everybody does that. Um, all that. Um, so. <laughs> but if we're in a situation where. Stand up. <laughs> I'm asking Seb just to hold this really still. If I want to practice rotating. Is that an exercise that I can do? Yeah. I'm almost pulling him over as well. So I think. But you're practicing hips and shoulders if you want to fix your hips you might face this way and try and rotate as far as you can and it's just thinking about the movement pattern more than the exercise if that makes sense so you're creating exercises to challenge the movement patterns that are really important in the sport um, now what you'll start to see is the more um, the more load we try and add, the further away we'll end up moving from the movements in our sport. Yeah, So we become less and less specific and more and more general. And actually, as the tethering feature for a lot of training that I deliver is this idea of what's going on in each plane and how do we manage that plane in the sport.